what's going on here? Why can I not be my true self? Mm. Masking my identity has been something that I have done a lot. You just shun your identity and diss your own identity. It'd be a joke, basically, whenever you would talk about that kind of background and heritage. I was on the radio on, on an Asian network and I learned so much about who I was and my identity and learning to be proud of that because I always just felt embarrassed of it. So that was a big lesson. When I stood up to it was at university. So I realized probably in the second year that I didn't want to become a solicitor. I know what I don't want to do. So let's work out what I do want to do. There's no grad scheme for entrepreneurship, yeah, is there? No. <laughs> Say you are a young person and you really want to start your own business. What advice would you give them? If there was someone that wanted to start a business, I first understand. Quick question, when did you discover that you're a leader, that your actions matter to those that look up to you? You may be an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur, innovating to change the world, or a CEO navigating a crisis, or a parent returning to work and learning to lead your career, your team, your children. There are many faces of leadership, and this is the podcast to explore them all. Welcome to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm a headhunter and founder of HVO Search, where I help ambitious leaders hire their executive teams. My job today on this show is to help you discover your superpowers, to help you avoid making some of the same mistakes, and to remind you that even if you do, perfection doesn't and shouldn't exist. Thank you so much for listening and please do subscribe and follow this podcast because it really helps others to discover these incredible stories. This show will challenge the way you think and may even change your life. Shana, welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you so you. much for coming. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's been a while because I met you at a podcast show it was the last session that I went to and I was just like really tired and I was like, you know what, and I was, let's just sort of go home. And then there you were with your other presenter there. And I was like, this girl is so young and so smart and is giving such really interesting insights and advice. And I was just so impressed well from podcast show to podcast this is great isn't it yes. I really appreciate that because you made my day that day when you came up to me and oh. in invited me so yeah thank you I'm mm. really excited for our chat you have started three companies already and at a really young age like how did you get into entrepreneurship like what what was your first venture and why did you come up with that I think I was one of those people, I was surrounded by entrepreneurs growing up. So my mum and dad founded a tea company uh, when I was as young as I can remember. And I was sitting there helping them pack and wrap every day and just understanding the kind of business, the way of a business from kind of selling a tea box on eBay to scaling it up and then get being able to retire early. So I feel like I was surrounded by that at an early age and that led me to play around and actually learn to take risks. So my first, I guess, proper uh, like big girl business was at university. And I, so I bought, it was born out of a problem, very much like a entrepreneur. I felt, felt frustrated by a problem and I wanted to solve it. And I was a DJ at university and I went to a club and I got turned down from the club. I was supposed to be DJing there. They looked me up and down and they were kind of like, you're not coming in. And that really got me because I was there with my, my rucksack. I kind of looked quite young as well. I guess I probably looked like an underage <laughs> now I think about it. But I was like, why is this happening? And there's a reason why there's not many women on lineups. And our confidence was being kind of faulted by before we even get to the club, let alone when we get on stage and have to deal with all the other layers that happen. So I created a safe space and really built a kind of multi-platform music hybrid kind of live streaming event um, space, which was incredible. And I really enjoyed throughout uni. I got to do some presenting, got to do some DJing, support incredible women and people of color as well. And we got some funding from O2. Like it was a very like early kind of uh, sparkle of entrepreneurship that really got me excited of actually 
there's not one path I can go down because I was a law student by day and this DJ by night. So I really had a real opposite uh, mm. kind of double life that I was living. And it really actually led to me to where I am today. I don't think if I hadn't done that, I don't, I maybe would be a solicitor. <laughs> mm. What you into DJing? Why did you decide to do that? Good question. I guess just love music, to be honest. Loved how a DJ can control uh, atmosphere and create experiences for others. There's something about when you're with your friends and you're you're taking control of the aux cord and putting on music creates connections. Mm -hmm. And there's something about that, that together you kind of bond over different kind of music. You have nostalgia, it kind of transports you to this other place. So I kind of see music as a bit of a portal and playing around with that is really fun. I have not been going to clubs for a very long time, especially <laughs> like having kids, pandemic. But I remember those days, like standing there and thinking this is just not worth it. To this day, I just would not stand in a queue. I think that's the one thing about entrepreneurship is you become obsessed with solving that problem and you can't stop thinking about it. You go to bed, I kind of wake up in the middle of the night with another idea, you write it on your notes. You find that you are so dedicated to the cause and I think that's an amazing trait of anyone that you're just so unapologetic and relentless in your drive. So it was a great kind of asset to have in life, I mm. feel, because then it means that you genuinely care about something and it wakes you up in the morning. And then to create a kind of career around that, I think is amazing, especially you've got a social impact side to it as well. So do you walk around and thinking, what's a problem I can solve? Or do you just see problems everywhere? I think the problem has to be something I'm really connected to and that I usually have felt firsthand and been so frustrated. I'm like, this needs to change. It can't just be that a plant has fallen on the floor and we can create a plant stand kind of thing. So I'm like, that to me is not that frustrating and it can be solved quite easily. So I think it has to be something that maybe is quite challenging as well. And that could help potentially millions and millions of people. I think I get really excited when I can help people. And that has always kind of come at the very core mm. of everything I do. Mm. And what was your second one? I guess there's been like mini ones in between as well, I guess over the pandemic too. But the second one was around uh, inclusion in, in a sense as well, actually. I found that's been a bit of a thread throughout all the business I've, ever, I've, I've kind of ever created. And it was around, I went and visited the city of New Orleans. Have you mm, ever been there? I have not, but I'm really, I've never been interested in, until up recently mm. and purely because of the music. Oh, it, exactly. Music, incredible music, food that is just nothing like you'll ever have in your life but also the culture there's something about the culture that they welcome you in just like your family and I just thought that was beautiful because you don't get that a lot when you've got this beautiful trio where you feel so at home so included and I wanted to kind of bottle that up and bring that to the UK in a kind of supper club form so we had some street food lots of like jazz music playing as you're eating so really curating the experience for everyone to be included so that was a really fun thing but I must say it taught me a lot in terms of burnout because I was managing a full-time job while running back and forth from quite physical setting up and cooking and creating so I burnt out quite quickly mm. and it took me over a year to get over that and actually become myself again and so I think now I'm really strict with my boundaries and when I stop and just noticing those little things that can happen as you feel like you're becoming overexhausted. At which point did you realize that was happening to you? Too late the first mm. time. That time it was way too late. I was then kind of not listening to people. So when someone's talking to you, you're just thinking about other things. And I was just so, I guess, in, indulged in this business. And I was just never switching off. I never had a time time off. I never was really seeing my friends, family. Like I wasn't truly aware of being present. I was just like stuck in this cycle. And it kind of came then too late that I realized I've crossed the boundaries when I had a day off. And then it all comes kind of crashing down. And I realized how burnt out I was. And I was like, I can never do this again. And ever since 
I think it's got easier each time I could notice it just that little bit quicker mm -hmm. that now I can notice it super quickly. And I'm like, okay, let's just put some boundaries in and just also creating a schedule is just a great way of doing that. And I think I wasn't doing that enough because of the full-time job. I was commuting two hours a day as well to add everything in the mix. It was just a lot. So that exhaustion hit quite quickly. It's funny, isn't it? When you feel so passionate about something and you really want to make it happen and you just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And, you know, part of being an entrepreneur, you're trying to do impossible things or things that have never been done before and quite often at pace. Mm -hmm. And... What's interesting about burnout is that you don't know it's happening until it's so far down and you're like, how did I even get there? And part of the recovery of it is being able to spot what those tells are. So do you know what your tells are? I guess it's that um, at the end of the day and I'm just continuously working and I can just feel myself exhausted the next day. It's like knowing the next day that I'm just overtired and I'm pushing through. Mm. I'm not giving myself a day off. So if I work through a weekend, I always now I'm like, I'll give myself a day off in the week and just being really flexible with it. Mm -hmm. So I'd say it's just like certain small things that I now put into place to like protect my future self. Yeah. It's always the small things. Like I realize that I get into that stage and burnout and then mm. it feels almost like I am angry at the world. Like for me, the anger really comes up. And what I've realized is that there's probably two things that happen. I start cleaning incessantly. Like the house all of a sudden is like everything wow. is untidy. Like even if in, and to the point where you like you will never achieve that perfection, but it's like trying to control the environment. Mm. But not only that, then I get annoyed or angry and quite aggressive <laughs> towards the people around me. And the other tell, which is probably even earlier than that, is when you're going to a cafe and it's just taking just too long and you're just so irritable mm. that sometimes I would just walk out in a, in a kind of in a huff and I'm like, now I re recognize that that's the early signs that you're just trying to do too many things mm. at once. So but. it's going to a cafe then each day and checking, being like, how am I responding? I <laughs> it's like, yeah, like, but it's not a conscious thing because now once you realize that this is happening, yeah. you know, it's, you know, it, I think that's the next level of awareness, right? When you're actually proactively testing yourself. But I think you almost catch it not even in the moment, but mm -hmm. maybe like 30 minutes later, it's like, yeah. oh, that happened. Oh, okay, now. And trying to catch it earlier and mm. earlier. Maybe there's something else that will happen. Yeah. But, um, it does get easier, I find, each time. Yes. Because I've seen, so my brother, for example, he's a Series A founder now, and he goes through cycles of burnout. And I try and give him all the learnings that I've had because I don't want him to go through the same burnout that I mm. went through because it's just not a nice thing to, to see anyone going through. How and does he take to your advice? Uh, not, doesn't listen. I, <laughs> <laughs> I do think it is maybe something that we all have to do and learn yeah. ourselves, learn the hard way, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what has been like the hardest lesson that you've learned? That is a good question the hardest lesson that I've learned is masking my identity has been something that I have done a lot throughout my life and it was only really this year that I came to terms with how much I was doing it I was code switching all the time I was pretending to be someone I not I'm not and I wish that it was something that I'd learned quicker I would say. So the lesson there is being myself yeah. um, and truly myself rather than it taking 10 years to kind of understand and actually get to the root of as mm. well. Because growing up in a white area, I went to school in this area where I had to blend in, especially as a teenager, you are just trying to fit in at school. And I was a coconut. I was like this token Asian. And so I just blended in. I shunned my identity. And I think I got so used to that, that it led to at work, the same things happening. And then every single situation, just following and copying that same road because it works, why not change it? And then it was only this year that, that it it all kind of came into kind of fruition of 
and, re- and the kind of reflection that goes with it of realizing, oh, what's going on here? Why can I not be my true self? Mm. And it was when I did the radio and I was on the radio on, on an Asian network and I learned so much about who I was and my identity and learning to be proud of that because I always just felt embarrassed of it. So that was a big lesson. So when you say shunned it, how did that kind of express itself? What were you just not talking about it? Is it something that you were doing externally or was it something that was just going on in, in your mind? Oh, it's phys- yeah, externally mm-hmm. uh, just as much. So we'd have, I guess now it's called like ethnic banter. So you just shun your identity and kind of diss your own identity Mm. in any, it'd be a joke basically, whenever you would talk about anything uh, to do with that, that kind of background and heritage. And it is something that is definitely a school uh, kind of uh, environment, I wouldn't say. defense mechanism. Yeah, and I think it is that kind of really wanting to blend in and be part of something. And especially when you know you're different as well. And I think I knew I was different in not just physically, but also in the career path I wanted as well. Like I think I knew quite early that maybe tradition isn't the path I want to go down. But when you're in a school which is law or medicine, then it makes that really hard. And so you do have to have an outlet and that's where the DJing must have come from and all these different things that there was a part of me that wanted to break out. And it was just, now I look back, it's taken me so long to realize that I was trying um, to do all these different things because that that was me, that was Mm -hmm. who I was. Mm -hmm. Was there a certain point where you realized that or was it a gradual realization? I think when I stood up to it was at university. So I realized probably in the second year that I didn't want to become a solicitor. And I was like, how am I going to now navigate the next steps in my life? Because everyone around me is applying for the next stage of being a solicitor or a barrister and kind of going down those steps. And I was like, that is too far for me. Like I'm going to have to work out um, what I'm going to do here. And so I kind of went all out with trying music, TV, film, marketing, all these different things and being like, I know what I don't want to do. So let's work out what I do want to do. And especially when everyone's going for kind of traditional grad schemes as well. I think I was like, there's no grad scheme for entrepreneurship. Is there? (laughs) No, there are some, but it's not something that's as established as going to university. Exactly. And I think I found something that was like a middle ground, I guess, after university, that kind of was this entrepreneur grad scheme in a sense. It was like where you're part of an entrepreneurship community. They teach you how to be an entrepreneur and put all the foundations in place, but you work for either a startup or an entrepreneurial role. And I think that was just perfect for me that I felt then I could really start to be myself and actually that I found something that I truly love to do. And yeah, if I was that solicitor, I would be miserable. So Mm. I'm really glad that I found that and it does exist, which Mm. is amazing. Mm. So what was your third startup? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, so the third startup, that was born out of um, experiencing a lot of microaggressions in the workplace. So So I think- So a microaggression, they're small slights. So they're little things that happen in the workplace that could be potentially racist or sexist. And they're kind of seen as like a drop of water on a laptop. Mm. So a drop of water is not going to do much, but just lots of them will break will break you in a way. And it was at the point where I'd had so many different things happen that I felt I I just wasn't myself anymore. And it was a form of burnout in a way. Mm -hmm. And I quit my job and uh, left there. And I started this uh, kind of startup uh, because I wanted to change that. And actually people a lot of the time don't realize they're doing a lot of the behaviors they have, it's all unconscious. And because of that, we need to learn and we need to understand how to control environments we're in, uh, how to create inclusive cultures. So just created an e-learning platform just for that. So it really gamifies behavior. And actually how can we create these incredible behaviors where we all feel included, we can all be ourselves and the company will thrive as a result. So that was really interesting. We were VC backed, um, which was amazing and got to work with some incredible B2B clients because we were a B2B business and still do now. And it's one of those things that 
it meant a lot seeing real change straight away as well that you can actually control and help so many people in the workplace. So it was very meaningful and fulfilling. Mm. So going back to what you were saying about behaviors. So, yeah. you know, it's it's modeling the right behaviors. What what are those behaviors? So things like inclusion, like inclusive behavior can mean um, being an inclusive leader at work. So you don't have to be in a leadership role to do that. You can lead if you notice something going on in a meeting, for example, and you can put a stop to it. And if you'll just pull them aside after the meeting and say, oh, hey, I noticed you use X language, just letting you know that this is probably the better way to say it. Um, and just ways like that where you can stand up and be brave in the workplace is really important because a lot of the time we let things kind of slip mm -hmm. and then it builds up and builds up. And just like it happened to me, no one ever called it out. And that is really tough when you feel like you're alone in the workplace as well. So having people have your back and notice and all together go on that journey, I think is really important. Mm. It's interesting and impressive that you have pinpointed it's the behaviors that really need to be expressed and explained because I was interviewing um, an author of a book called The Broken CEO. And one of the things he says in the book is like, behaviors eat values for breakfast, in the sense that you can say that you are inclusive, you know, you value diversity, but when behaviors don't match up with those values, it's completely irrelevant. So actually, you know, zeroing in on that and, you know, making them really, really tangible, and that's what really makes the difference. I agree. It's like actions speak louder than words, right? And in a lot of workplaces, we saw everyone use the word diversity. It was such a tick box. Mm -hmm. And we used to have an eye roll in certain workplaces I've worked in because every time they mentioned the word diversity, you kind of be like, oh, here we go again, because we knew that there were no action behind the words. And so that's really difficult, especially when you have so many layers and so many diverse people in your organization, you have to nurture them and you can't just invite them in if you don't know how to look after and create inclusive cultures for everyone. And you have to make sure that everyone benefits from it. So, so what is an inclusive culture to you? What does that look like? That is a space where everyone can be themselves unapologetically. They can all be able to thrive in the workplace without barriers as well, because there's just institutionary, a lot, a lot of barriers that people have to face and they might be unconscious. And that's just in the hiring process, for example, we have so many things and that's why we're in place. We have like um, blind CVs, for example, now, which showcase that we can't, uh, look at we look at a name and we're less likely to pick that person because of their foreign name and just all those things need to change and just being aware of those biases mm -hmm. is really important so yeah a place where everyone can be themselves I think is really important mm. I mean having started three companies even at such a young age and I keep saying that but you know you're really <laughs> setting an example to people so you're having to lead do you see yourself as a leader I would say I'm a leader in, I guess, different respects. So I personally see leadership as a bit of a mindset that I control and influence people within my realm, I would say. Like, I don't currently lead lots of different people. Like, I'm not in a large corporate where I'm leading. I can just see, like, in my head, like, a, a big boardroom and a person standing there is how I would kind of traditionally picture leadership. Mm. But actually, how I see leadership in a way is that it's, you know, going through the storms. It's, it's setting out those outcomes and it's being relentless in everything that you do. And, but also knowing your boundaries as well. And that's something that I've realized and taking back that control mm -hmm. and constantly learning and evolving. And I feel like I've been through lots of different things uh, by the age of 26. Like I feel like I've lived lots of different lives, but I'm proud that I've just been constantly evolving and learning. And I feel like in the next three years, I'll probably be doing something else maybe. Mm. And actually I really enjoy that, that it's just always reading, always wanting to learn and that willingness to learn will really help you evolve. So leadership, I guess, yeah, I think it's a mindset, definitely. Mm. With regards to funding, so let's talk about that because you're talking about being in a program about raising funds. Talk to me about what that process is like and how it's been for you. So 
for us, we were lucky because a raised VC backed through an accelerator. So we were going to go through the kind of pre-seed standard kind of cycle of reaching out to investors, but that was all cut short because of being enrolled onto an accelerator that was a VC as well, gave us equity um, funding. And that was an opportunity to then also have learning involved as well. So they teach you how to scale, which actually in hindsight was something that I needed for my confidence and strategy rather than finding a pre-seed uh, angel investor and then just being like you go now you've got the money so I think I needed that so for us we didn't have the kind of tr- traditional funding background but actually now I'm moving over from kind of entrepreneur side of the table to the VC side of the table and I've just finished kind of training to be a VC and now starting to Asian invest and it's so interesting just the different mindset that you do need to have and what the other person will see as opposed to the founder kind of approach of just hustle, hustle, hustle and see where you can get. And I think that's been a huge learning. Mm. What's been the hardest thing about being an entrepreneur? I guess we've touched upon it before. I think it's the burnout for Mm -hmm. sure. And just the obsession with always wanting to be dedicated to a cause, but regard disregarding your mental health, disregarding potentially your friends and family uh, because of your work. So I think that can be really tough and it's knowing that and then controlling it is really, really important. Mm-hmm. I think that's the thing. When you start to neglect your personal life, your friends, your family, even yourself, when you're talking about boundaries, about Mm. having no personal boundaries either, it's going to take a toll on you as a leader, as a founder, as a, you know, a CEO or a manager, or even, you know, having to kind of lead yourself. What, what do you think each entrepreneur needs to bear in mind? Okay, let's just, let's rephrase the question. Say you are a young person and you really want to start your own business, what advice would you give them? That is a great question. I think if there was someone that wanted to start a business, I first understand the why. Like, why are they wanting to create this in the first place? Because you've also got to think of like the longevity of it. Is it, is it something that you want to create to change the world? Is it something to just help you become financially stable? And that's okay as well, because everyone has different reasons, but it's just connecting with that because that's gonna help you get up in the morning and keep you going through that thick and thin and through those things when everything goes wrong and you're like, why am I here? And you just keep going back to that why. So I think just understanding that first. I think as well, when we look now to social media, There's been, especially just since the pandemic, a lot of people have started side hustles and we've now glamorized it a lot more. Like every time I go on social media, it's celebrating a win. And I think it's knowing that you're going to fail and facing that failure head on, I think is really important in terms of advice of just embracing that if it doesn't go right, that's okay. And that's part of the process because I remember my first kind of big failure and it consumed me and I just couldn't stop thinking about it. It it affected my mental health. Whereas now I see failure as a good thing and this is a learning. This one was one when I was building this third business and it was a, you know, like a grant competition and you submit your deck, you then go to a pitching stage and then there's a winner. And I was like, right, I've got to get this pitch ready and worked really hard on this pitch deck, kind of put everything into it. And I didn't get through to the next stage. And I think that really got me because I was like, why is this happening to me? And actually internalized it, that it was a personal thing. And looking back, I can't like the way I reacted. I think it, I think it must've been, it felt like an over-exaggeration because when I look now, whenever, if anything happened to me like that now, I'm more like, what can I learn from this? And what's coming around the corner? I'm always like, when a door closes, a window is opening somewhere and I'm just waiting for that right time and just continuing to work at it. Whereas I felt like I'd be a lot more likely to give up um, a couple of years ago. 
So I think failure and facing failure, and I just love this quote, rejection is redirection. Mm -hmm. And just always embracing that something is changing, a new pathway is opening and just going down that path and embracing the unknown. Mm. I mean, I I love talking about failure Mm. and it might sound like a very strange thing to to admit, but without that, you're not trying hard enough. I, I remember when I was doing rock climbing back in the day, and I have mentioned this before, it's like, if you're not falling off, you're not trying hard enough. Mm. So this idea of never getting your foot wrong, never falling off, never, you know, getting every single thing right, you know, it's, you know, it's safe. It makes you feel comfortable, but actually you don't really make the progress. And it's really, when we really think about it, it's, it's the really difficult times that you had to face that really teach you that lesson. And sometimes you don't really see the lesson until it's a really, really kind of big failure because you had to kind of fail several times for it to to arrive there. But I think it's learning how to do this in a consistent, almost proactive way, as Mm -hmm. opposed to Oh, it's a failure it's the end of my life, but actually not even anticipating it, but knowing that at some point it's going to happen and mm-hmm. that's okay. And then having the emotional tools to be able to deal with that, because you were saying how you internalize that and it's all about you. Like it's not something that happened that is a mistake or a failure that mm-hmm. like you are the failure and it's all about you. And that's quite paralyzing. But um, how did you move on from that? I think it is, you're right, you're having the tools in your kind of toolkit ready for if that ever happens again and just getting better at managing it each time. Because I'm going through a a career pivot in a way at the moment and I'm constantly failing. I'm constantly going through. On purpose or just? (laughs) Not on purpose. Through the process. Yeah, just through the process Mm -hmm. of facing rejection and uh, Mm -hmm. trying things that are so uncomfortable that you don't even want to start the project because it feels so unknown. But I've learned so much that you just have to keep going and being, yeah, having those kind of minds, that mindset in place and knowing that you kind of got to treat yourself as well when you failed and knowing that it's okay. Like I've learned this, maybe we'll do some journaling to just break it down and understand why this has happened and just get back and start the next day afresh Mm -hmm. uh, because it's just going to keep happening. So sometimes I found initially, especially with uh, the new kind of skill set that I'm learning, that I just would avoid. (laughs) I would avoid anything uncomfortable. But now I'm like, it's in the diary. I'm going to do it. I'm going to make sure I just face it head on. (laughs) Where did you pick up these tools? Is it something that you have worked out for yourself or... You feel like maybe you learned that from other people or is it a proactive process that you've gone through thinking, how can I deal with this? I think a mix, I'd say, of like you have your life experience, but also just reading books and listening to podcasts and just picking up how others have done it. I think as well, it's like that resilience. I think at school, one thing that makes me laugh is they would always talk about the word resilience and that you just keep getting back up and you keep going. And I think that has been instilled into every student at my school. And we laugh now about it because that R word (laughs) we'd always talk about, but it's so true. It is the word resilience and just learning how to get back up. But I just think it's finding out what works for you because not, you can't really apply a one size fits all and expect it to work. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a bit of testing a bit of playing around as well and knowing personally what works mm. you you mentioned earlier that you you're going through a career pivot and you've also left your I suppose corporate job how is it redefining you what are your thoughts on that it's redefined me in so many different ways because I feel like uh, we talked about leadership now and actually I've had to take back control of my career. So if I don't work now, I don't get paid. And taking control of all those things like your finances, your taxes, and I can now create from scratch this perfect week in a way that I can do a day on this, a day on that. And that has been really powerful because I never knew I could actually create from scratch a kind of meaningful life and do one like a investor and kind of VC 
uh, projects on one day and then the next day can be doing DJing. And it's just amazing that you can get paid for all these things. And I just think we're so traditional when we think of career, but actually you can create whatever you would like and still get paid for it. And at the end of the day, you're completely fulfilled. So that's been really eye-opening because I always thought that I would just have to climb the corporate ladder and be happy with kind of small bonuses here and there and just wait for that promotion and wait for permission Mm. from a manager as Mm. well to do something. Whereas now I'm super proactive in everything I do. Like if I would like a mentor, if I would, I do want to find that client, you have to go out and do it yourself. And that has been really inspiring to me that you can, there's no ceiling now. Mm. You're talking about the social media and seeing that everyone's got like a side hustle. It's not just about a side hustle becoming my main hustle. I would say it's more about creating a life of, that is meaningful and, and full of purpose. So I wouldn't say I'd have a side hustle anymore in that respect, that I now just do everything that I'd like to do with my day. And that has been something that is quite eye-opening that I didn't quite realize. that Actually, you can wake up every day mm-hmm. and want to do all these different things. And I think for me, I've always, I've always felt that I'm a bit different because I don't want to do one thing. I'm not like, I want to be known for X. Mm-hmm. I want to do my presenting, my DJing, my uh, investing, all these different things. And it sometimes feels a bit confusing. Mm-hmm. And I've come to terms with that's okay. And actually I have this kind of by day, by night, And I like who I am because of that, because I get to try all these incredible things and every day is different. Mm. So I guess having numerous side hustles in one. (laughs) I always say to, especially younger people, that just try things in the beginning. Like, you know, you don't have to stick with just one thing because it's also experimenting. It's about learning what you enjoy and you know, when other people are saying, well, you're good at this. And it's like, well, well, I might be good at that, but I actually don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I'm not so great at this, but I absolutely love that. And I just want to spend more time developing that skill. I think it can be very, very helpful and advantageous. Yeah. Cause I think you can pursue all your goals at once. Mm. I think you need to be careful and not have you know, a million things that you're doing. But if you are focused, you do have enough time to work and do really well in two things rather than focusing on one. And I think that there's that kind of just focus on it and then then move to the next thing. But I don't necessarily agree with that anymore. Mm-hmm. I think I'm so happy now having a balance because I get quite bored really easily. And if I focus on that one thing, I think I'd get tired of it. So actually having all these different things helps you be creative, helps you kind of make sure that you're using all sorts of different skills and you're learning all the time. And I love that, that you can kind of build this, the kind of skill stacking and have lots of different things going at once. Mm. Looking back, would you do anything differently? I try to live life with no regrets, definitely. Mm. But... I think confidence for me has always been something that I've struggled with. Uh, Being confident to just back myself, to take risks and live a career that I'm proud of. I think that I've always been scared of who I am in a way. And so I think I I wish that I'd been more confident in certain risks that I'd taken. So even like when I finished university, I um, was doing presenting and DJing at university. I was picking up awards and I wish I'd carried that on after university rather than just going straight into a corporate kind of thing. And I've only just picked that back up kind of in the last year. And I was just wondering like, if I'd have done that, I'd have been my confident self and I would have grown and really helped me rather than like going back into my shell and being like, oh, you need university's done now. I don't need to do it anymore. Mm-hmm. When actually it really got me out of my comfort zone. So I'd say, yeah, backing, backing self is a mm-hmm. huge thing that I wish I would tell myself. What else would you tell your younger self? I would also talk about the fact that I had to mask my identity for so long. Mm -hmm. I think I would have gone on that self-discovery journey earlier if I'd realized and pushed myself out out of that. And I think if I had that confidence, I think maybe I would have been like, 
no, I'm not going to do this anymore and turned around to myself and had a conversation and said, what are you doing? So I think I wonder what my life would have been, have been now if, if I had done that earlier and how would I have been connected to my culture a lot more? And just in general, how would I preserve my heritage and culture um, as I grew up rather than feeling like I was embarrassed of it? Mm. It's just self-acceptance too. Yeah. Yeah, such a big thing. Yeah, and I think that self-acceptance has come quite late, I guess, I in a way. So. No? I think so. No, I think people <laughs> go through their lives not accepting yeah. them themselves until maybe even never. Yeah, you know? so that's so I true. think it could never be too late. I think, you know, I was just saying this earlier, how, you know, it's just going to take however long it takes for the lesson and for that thing to sink in. And when it does... And you think, oh, I wish I'd known this earlier. Then you know you've learned that well. Yeah. Then you know that it's meaningful. And actually, from that point on, mm -hmm. you can build on that. It's true. And I, but I'd also think as well, where society is now, if I was growing up now, and I was, say, 16, I think I'd be completely different. I think they're a lot more self-accepting in terms of the younger generation and they have idols that look like them now. And I think all of that environment that I grew up in where I only had kind of one, say, main person in a film, uh, in, in films that looked like me and was the main character that wasn't degrading and that wasn't uh, stereotypical. And when I went to magazines and kind of seeing that you, you just never have uh, yourself being represented there. So I think the younger generation are just have a lot more opportunity in that way that they can be themselves and they're all about embracing their identity. And I think that's a beautiful thing. You can idolize the younger generation to some extent, but it's true. They do have more role models to look up to who can say, well, I did it this way and so can you. Um, I suppose the nearest best thing is to be it. Mm. Uh, yeah, a hundred percent. And I think that's why I'm now pivoting into becoming an investor because we've got the gender gap of funding and in institutional funding It is so small and minute of how much we're uh, a female founded team is, is receiving. And then when you go to marginalized founders and people of color in general, we're receiving even smaller amounts. And I think that for me is being that change and investing out of my own pocket as well now because it's so important that we need to make sure that this does not happen and this changes ASAP. That's even like looking at pitch decks now. I was looking at a few just this morning and the team slide, just noticing things like, oh, it's an all white male team. Maybe that's something we should talk to the founders about. Do they have any advisors? What are they doing? Because diversity of thought is so important. And I think having someone actually just say, hold on a minute, have you ever noticed this? Otherwise they'd probably have gone on to series A and series B, probably not even noticing that and probably continuing on. So it's really important. Um, our job is really important to do that. No, for sure. What seems impossible to you now, but should you achieve that will change the course of your life or your business? I think there's many things that I want to achieve and push myself to achieve. The biggest, I think there's financial for one, is I think having that, money mindset and like there's this block that can you ever achieve that kind of million mark and 10 million etc as you grow and I think that can feel quite impossible sometimes of like how can I get there but I think since going kind of freelance and self-employed and removing that ceiling I now feel like it is maybe that slight bit more <laughs> possible but I think when I was younger I put uh, this challenge of I want a million at least a million by 30 really? and the I think a lot of things by 30 which mm. now I look back I'm like why did I put all these things that life does not end at 30 I don't know what what was going on there um but now looking back knowing that there's that opportunity that yeah that you can achieve that but that felt really impossible in my young, like younger 20s that 
how am I going to do that? Like if I'm only on 30K in a full-time job, how am I going to get to a million and compound that and grow that in just a couple of years mm-hmm. kind of thing? Life happens, you know, our ideas change, you know, what you want to be and how you want to be in the world also change. I mean, it's all about going deeper within yourself and thinking, well, actually, why do I want those things? You were talking about Mm. finding the why, like what about it makes me feel fulfilled or happy or how am I contributing? I mean, I'd like the advice to younger kids is don't ask what do you want to be? Ask what problem you want to solve. Mm. And I feel like through the conversation with you, you know, you really pursued that in terms of like what problem am I solving? And I almost think that's even more important than the why sometimes because it takes it away from, you know, from yourself and actually focusing on the contribution mm. of like, how do you contribute to to the society or to the world in general? So, Do you know what as well, just you saying that, and if I do look back at my younger self, so I was extremely introverted growing up. Do you know um, your kind of school report yes. and you go to your parents' evening and uh, they would always say, she never speaks. Mm. <laughs> my parents, oh, well, how different you are now. <laughs> my parents would be now. like, yeah. <laughs> no. mm. my parents would always be like, oh, Charlie, you should you know, try and mm-hmm. speak once a lesson or whatever. And my brother was the opposite. It was always, um, he speaks too much in a way. And um I think looking back now, even that is, I'm so proud that I can even say that I can present on stage now and I can be that person that I never thought I would be be Mm -hmm. and be able to step into that. I think my younger self, if I met my, you know, 10 year old, 15 year old self, I think it would be a great kind of inspiration to be like this is you and you can do this Mm -hmm. even though it feels like you can't you can Mm -hmm. yeah because you don't always know what what you want or what is possible like I wanted to be like a million things when I was like 10 years old I wanted to do it all Mm. (laughs) and as you I feel still feel like that now do you (laughs) actually it's true it's probably some of it is still there it's like oh I don't want to be just like you said like just the one thing um but you know I read this book which I quote a lot by Oliver Berkman Mm -hmm. called 4,000 Weeks oh it's a great book have you read it yeah so I love the analogy that he uses about putting the you know like you said well put the big rocks in then you know it's more actually that's not how life works we put the big rocks and we don't have enough space in the jar for all of the big rocks that we want. So we have to be somewhat selective in terms of what goes in there. And it doesn't have to be one big giant rock, mm-hmm. but it can be several, but we still have to choose. Yeah. And I I feel that more and more as I age <laughs> because there's only so much time to dedicate to everything. But then do you find that every kind of five six years that you feel like you want to add some a new rock in or they feel like a new chapter has opened in a way I'm not sure I'm doing this proactively I think it's probably something that just you know with kids for example like I knew Mm. I wanted to have a family and having children has been an amazing experience and I feel like they were just sort of added into my life (laughs) and I have to maybe look at other rocks that there isn't any space because they are more important than the other rocks, mm-hmm. so to speak. Mm-hmm. So I think it's, it's, you have to assess because, you know, I've started doing acting classes, for example, because yeah. I used to do theater studies and do I have enough time to dedicate to doing that? Maybe not to the same extent as other things, but yes, I can carve out a little bit of time. Is it a big rock? Probably not, but it's something that still needed the care and attention to, decide whether I want something like that in my life Mm. so so yeah you're interviewing me now (laughs) (laughs) so but um Shana I really appreciate you being on the show and I think you have all the you know journey still ahead of you and I'm so excited to see what you come up with next because I think you're the one to watch so thank thank you for coming on the show no thank you you've inspired me it's incredible everything that you're doing as well so it's been a great chat i really appreciate it thank you so much for joining me here on anatomy of a leader what did you discover in this episode i'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments on youtube or reviews on apple podcasts and if you haven't already hit that subscribe or follow buttons and i'll see you next week